Good morning, good morning. I'm going to invite you to get your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn over with me to Psalms 95. This is a passage of Scripture that, uh, that we open every service with. Uh, it's a declaration that uh, gets our mind focused and, and ready to go into the Word of God and into the house of God and into worship. So uh, we're going to read together today uh, Psalms 95, verses 1 through 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his and he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands today if you will hear his voice. Father God, we thank you today that we can come into your presence. Lord, that we can worship you, Father God. Your word tells us that you're seeking those that will worship you in spirit and in truth. So Father God, our prayer today is that you're pleased with our attitudes, our actions, and our words today, Father God. Lord, accept and receive our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
You father the orphan. Your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness, and your grace restores my soul. You're making me like you. You're clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame.
working Even when I don't feel it you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it you're working Even when I don't feel it you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. No. Yeah. 
atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we love you, God. We need your fresh anointing, God. Your sweet hope. commit this time to you. Help us not to forget what that presence feels like. God, when we just sing to you and when we invite you into our homes and we invite you into our churches and we invite you into our lives, help us not to forget what your presence feels like, what your peace feels like, what your joy feels like. God, we just commit this time to you. We commit our hearts to you, God. God, we want to just ask you to send a new refreshing to this country, to our homes, to our families, God, in this time where we feel a little, little separate from each other. God, I just pray, Lord, that you bring us together. Unify us in the spirit, God. Help us, Lord, to long more after you. Long for your presence. Long for who you are. And to remember what that feels like in our lives. Thank you, God, for always being just a prayer away, a touch away. Thank you that your presence fills us daily. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Whew. 
It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, those of you who are watching today, do me a favor and drop down in the notes section that you're here. Uh, send us a little comment, a hi or a, an amen. And uh, I always like to laugh and joke with people, say I've got a better amen pew online than I have in the, in the church. But uh, um, it is good to, uh, to have you all with us this morning. A um, couple of things um, that we uh, are doing, our Wednesday night Bible study, um, we're going back to uh, the Zoom services and the Zoom studies. So if you would like to be included on that invitation list, uh, drop us a message. Um, you can send it to mail at oasiswv.org. Again, that's mail at oasiswv.org. You can send that to us. And um, we will get it that way. Um, so, you know, for the time being, where we're at is we're going to go back to just online services. So all of our in-person, face-to-face services have been put on hold uh, with everything that's going on and, and, and all of that. We just figure that this is the best uh, course of action for us at this point in time. Uh, so that's where we're at. So thank you guys for being faithful and joining with us. And being a part of what we're doing, Um, God has shown his hand faithful through all this mess that's been going on. God has shown himself faithful, and we just ask him to continue to do so. Um, So uh, we're going to be reaching out to uh, some of you, Etika, and I would like to to be able to see your faces. So I'm going to reach out to you and see if we can't schedule. I think we're going to call it, uh, what can we call it? And we can call it coffee with, with the pastors or something to where uh, we're going to try to set up Zoom meetings with you. Uh, Etika misses seeing all the kids' faces and, and, uh, and seeing you guys. So we want to try to set those up to where uh, we can just check in and, and make sure everybody's doing good. Because and, and, uh, we miss seeing your faces. We miss seeing your faces. So it'll be good to, to uh, be able to connect that way. And... Uh, so again, if you would like to be part of those Wednesday night Bible studies, please drop us a line on that and we can get you a part of that. Uh, as far as your giving and your tithes and your offerings, man, you guys have been phenomenal. Uh, greatly appreciate you. Um, your tithes can come across by PayPal. Again, that PayPal account is mail at oasiswv.org. Uh, you should see that in your notes section uh, on the live stream. So Uh, or you can mail it here to the church or drop it off. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that we can come into your word, Father God, together, and that, Lord, we can glean and we can learn more about you. So, Father God, I ask that you would guide and direct everything that I say today. Lord, that it be edifying and uplifting to your people and your children, Father. Lord, we just are so grateful, so grateful. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Where I'd like to pick up today is on the um, last of the values, uh, of the list of values that we've done. We've preached the last few weeks on them. Um, You can go back and look at some of the notes and see, but we have Uh, In that process, on the bulletins, we have one on the back of the bulletins. Uh, You're going to see it showing up on all of our uh, website, on the uh, Facebook page and all of it. Uh, We've talked about the values that we need to be operating as and in as a church. Those values have been share, love, grow, serve, and today we're going to talk about live. You know, all those things can be wrapped up in this last section, in this last one. Um, you know, we tried to put them into words that weren't Christianese, that just a normal person from the street that had never been in church before could understand. You know, when we talk about share, we're talking about evangelism. We're talking about sharing your faith, sharing the things that God's done for you. That's what we're talking about. With love, we're talking about community. We're talking about reaching out into the community. We're talking about loving people the way God loves us. 
When we talk about grow, we're talking about personal growth, but also discipleship to where we're pouring into other people. Uh, Very, very, very important that we do that, fulfilling the Great Commission. And then when we talk about serve, we're talking about ministry. That is where you put feet to what you say. You get involved and you do with what you say. This last one as live uh, would be to worship, to worship God. Our base scripture for this is in John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. It says this, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This whole process is God's looking for this people. God is looking for and searching for because we were created for worship. We were created for worship, but so many times we have a misunderstanding of what that word actually means and where we're at. Some people, when we talk about worship, they'll mention worship services. They'll talk about going to church. Uh, They'll talk about singing. They'll talk about praising God and those things, and that is part of it. That is a portion of it. The other portion of worship is what you do every day, is just living your life. It said this, that worship is first an attitude. It is an, and it is the attitude in action that produces worship. It's your attitude, it's what's in your heart, put into action that produces your worship. You know, we talk so many times on the worship team that what is in your heart will come through your instrument. If you've had a bad day and you've had a bad attitude uh, or you were just in a fight with your wife on the way to church, that will come out of your worship. When you play your music, what's in your heart is going to come out. It's the same way in your everyday life. What is in your heart is going to come out in your worship, is going to come out in how you live. Lamar Boschman puts it this way, when your lips don't match your heart, there is no worship. I want to say that again. When your lips don't match your heart, there is no worship. The word of God says you you say that you love people, but you don't act on it. It's not any good. If you, you can, you can preach, you can teach, you can do all these things, but if you're not living it, if you're not doing it, then it's not truly worship. You're not congruent in your spirit. So what you're saying with your mouth is not being produced in your actions. Your attitude is the fuel that is going to power your worship. It's either going to power you towards worship or you're going to get bad gas and you're not going to be able to run. Your vehicle is going to shut down. You're going to stop worshiping. You know, if you remember the story of Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas were in jail, right? They had been beaten. They had been thrown in jail for uh, preaching the gospel doing what they knew God wanted them to do. They were beaten, and it says about midnight, they're having this conversation. And they say, well, what are we going to do? Paul looks at Silas and says, why don't we just worship? Why don't we just praise God? In the darkest time, what happened was the attitude of their heart broke through and pushed through the circumstances and the situations that they were in. They were in prison. Their backs were bleeding. There were rats nibbling at their toes. It was a bad day. We could agree on that, I hope. That's a bad day. Most of us have not had that kind of a day. But it was a bad day. But what happened was their attitude pressed through the badness of the day and produced worship. So it's not our circumstances that produce our worship. 
It's what's inside of us. Worship is not what we see on the outside. Worship is who we are on the inside. It's something that has to come from deep inside of you. There's two types of worship that I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you first about vertical worship, and then I want to talk to you about horizontal worship. Vertical worship is when I am adoring God. I'm worshiping God with my mouth. I'm singing. I'm praising God. John Piper puts it this way. True worship is based on a right understanding of God's nature, and it is a right valuing of his worth. This is horizontal worship, this, or this is vertical worship. When I'm getting an understanding and gaining an understanding of who God is, Exodus chapter 15, starting at verse 11, this is when the children of Israel, Moses, began to get a clue of who God was. It says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness? Fearful in praise is doing wonders. You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows them. You in your mercies have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. So you begin to look and say, God, look how great you are. Look at the things you can do. So many times we get so wrapped up in our situations that we don't turn around and we don't recognize the hand of God in the middle of that situation. The hand of God in the middle of all of it. Even when circumstances seem like they're bad and even when circumstances seem like they're out of control, find the hand of God. This is worship. This is when I look and I say, even though I see uh, how the psalmist put it, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil because you're with me. What he's saying is, God, you're strong enough to take me through. The word says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I began to look at those things, but we concentrate so much on the thing of the world. We see it. It's right in front of us. And we say, wow, this is such a big thing. Truth of the matter is I serve a big God. King of kings and Lord of lords. Above all, his name is more powerful than any other name. But here's the issue. We say it, but we're not congruent to it. So many times in my life, I can go and I can say, God, I know you're great. I know you're great. And then I go on about my life trying to fix things myself, trying to worry my way through it, trying to make something happen. When the truth of the matter is God is great and he's got it. I've just got to worship him through it. I've got to become, become congruent with what I'm saying so that my worship matches my actions. It makes it happen. My attitude becomes right in the sight of God, and my worship then becomes acceptable in the sight of God. See, worship is really based on your values. All of those core values that we've been talking about, all of that is where our worship is based. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be, the word says. So what happens is this. You will and I will worship something because we were created to do so. So what I'm going to worship is what I place the highest value on. Some people worship their jobs. They place the highest value on their jobs. Some people worship their houses. They place the highest value on their house or the things that they have. They place such a high value. Listen, having nice things is great. God's not anti-nice things. It's fine to do that. But when our value, if those things are so high that they become what we worship, because we put all of our life strength, all of our life force into trying to make those happen. 
Luke chapter 10, verse 27 says this, and he said, or he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Here's the thing. How can we love God with all of us when all of us is about something else? This is where worship comes in, where everything I do is based off of how is this going to affect my relationship with God? Is this going to get in the way of my relationship with God? If it's going to get in the way with my relationship with God, it's wrong. It's something that I shouldn't be doing. If it's going to enhance my relationship with God, then it's something I should do. Let's look back at Luke 10 again. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. All of your heart. Remember, we talked about your values. Where are your values? Your values are based out of your heart. From the abundance of the heart, your mouth is going to speak. You're going to say what's in there. It's going to come out. It's going to come out. That's why the congruency is so important that my heart, all of my heart, is poured into loving God. With all my strength, with every waking moment that I have, everything I should do, everything that I am doing, should be to glorify God. This is how I live my worship. It's so much more than just singing on Sunday morning. That is part of it. The dance, the clapping, the warfare, you know, that's all part of it. I can take you all the way through the scriptures and show you that portion of worship. But I can also take you to a story of a little woman who just had a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil and was going to make a cake and was going to die. But God required it of her and said, give me first. That's what the prophet said to her, give me first. And then what did God do for her? Completely sustained her through all of. See, that was worship. That was worship. When I'm, when I'm going through a situation in my life and understanding that the situation's hard, uh, I may not want to go through it. I may be battling my way through it. I may be struggling through it. But I can go back to God and I can say, God, what am I learning through this? How is this strengthening my relationship with you? How can I live you in the midst of all this? When I go to work every day, how can I live you at work every day? This is horizontal worship. Horizontal worship is what I do here on earth. And we base that out of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 22. It says, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Wow. So in other words, I go to work and I'm working for a company. I am to obey and do the best that I can do while I'm there not for accolades and pats on the back, but for and from sincerity of heart because of the fear of God. This is how I live it and go through it every day. And it says this in verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily. I think the King James says wholeheartedly with everything you have as unto the Lord and not unto men. This is horizontal worship. This is where I'm living out my worship. It's easy to sing and to say, God, you're great. I love you. It's, it's easy. But when it becomes difficult is when I step out into the world and I have to live what I say. Because, see, the world is looking for congruency. Congruency. The world is looking for the truth. 
But it's funny, we say the world is, but if we go all the way back to our base scripture, who else is looking for truth? Let's look at it again. John chapter 4. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. So we say all the time, the world is looking for the truth. The world is looking for the truth. And that is a true statement. But here's the big kicker. God is looking for truth. The word tells us that God judges the attitude and intent of the heart. What he's saying by that is I am looking for somebody that is going to worship me where they are, how they are, how I created them to be, with no show, with not putting up any airs, but this is just the fact of who I am. That's what God's looking for. Somebody just to worship him. The question is, can we be that? Can we do that? How do we get to that point to where we worship him at that level? Back in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. What's my motivation for everything that I'm doing? What is that driving force? You remember we said that our attitude was the fuel of my worship. My attitude, where I'm at, how I see things. And, and you know, there are people, and we, we hear it talked about, are you an op- optimist or a pessimist? Uh, is your glass half empty or half full? Um, you know, that's what we have to get past. The simple fact of the matter is there's a glass and there's something in it. And I'm grateful for what's there. Job got to the point where he said, listen, I came into the world naked. I can leave the same way. Everything belongs to God and great is God. See, that's when Job went from being a godly man, because the word said he was a godly man, so much so that the enemy was upset because the enemy said, I can't touch him. It's not fair. But see, God, at that point, Job was a godly man, but was not a worshiper. Go back and read it. Look at it for yourself. Job was doing all the right things. Job was giving sacrifices on a daily basis. He was doing all the things he was supposed to be doing. On the outside, everything looked woo-woo. He was under the protection of God, but he had a root of fear. How do I know that? Because he said so. The thing I feared most has just happened to me. The thing I feared most has just come upon me. The reality of his heart came out. The reality of his heart was this. I see everything I have, and I'm afraid to lose it. That's what he was afraid of. And he lost everything, save his life. His kids decided to have a party. We're over at Big Brother's house just having a great time. And the roof collapses and kills them all. But Job turns and said, I was doing all the right stuff. I gave a sacrifice for their life. I was praying for their life. But see, Job had not yet become a worshiper. But through the process, when you look, you'll see a transition in Job where he goes from being a man of God who knew about God to a worshiper who knew God. Major difference. Because here was the shift. God, everything I have belongs to you. You're great. And then God restored to him I'm drawing a blank on how many fold, but it was many fold above and beyond what he had before because 
He went from being a man of God who knew about God to being a worshiper who knew God. So many times in our life, it appears that we're doing the right things, that we're going through all the proper motions, but the problem is our heart's not in it. You can come to church, you can log on and be sitting there. I won't tell you how some of them told me they were sitting watching the services. I don't, I'm trying to keep that picture out of my head. Those of you who are watching know who you are. I won't expose you today. <laughs> but I can do all that. I can log on. I can come to the church. I can do all these things and still not know God. I just know about him. I just have a knowledge of who he is. But see, a worshiper is someone that experiences God that realizes that I am nothing without God. I have nothing without God. I can do nothing without God. Everything I am is because of him. And then I utilize the talents that he's given me to glorify him. Wow. This is true worship. This is living it out. It's not giving it lip service, but it's allowing my lips to match my heart, which will produce worship. There is another flip side to this, that some people are afraid to say what's in their heart. They're afraid to speak anything. Here's another key about worship. Worship is not silent. Worship does not become worship until it's verbalized, until it's lived. You can say, I'm a worshiper, and not do anything. It's not worship. Just like the Word of God says about faith. Faith without action, the Word of God says, is what? Dead. It's of no effect. And so I believe God, 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 but I never walk that belief. God, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you, but I never walk that worship. Am I truly worshiping God? Am I truly stepping into all that God has for me? Am I truly touching those that are around me? When I go in and I look and I say, God, I worship you, am I sharing? Am I evangelizing? Because if I'm worshiping God, I'm not going to be afraid to tell people about God. Because the thing that I worship, I will talk about. It's going to come out of me. Just in general conversation, it's going to come out of me. Do I really love? Because the Word says you can do all this stuff, but if you don't have love, it's just like beating on a cymbal. It gets annoying after a while. It just gets annoying after a while. Am I growing? Am I discipling people? Am I personally growing? This is my worship. Because if I'm truly worshiping God, I'm spending time with God. If I'm spending time with God, just by the simple fact of spending time with him, I'm going to grow. If I'm truly worshiping, I'm going to pull someone and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Now we're into discipleship. Am I really serving? Do you have your phone here? No, it's where you sent me that post. I'm going to walk down here and get my phone. Etika sent me a post um, the other day and, uh, I have my phone cause it has my timer on it. So I know how long I'm preaching in case I get too long winded. Cause some of you guys are smelling the cookie and going on in the kitchen right now. But in this post that she sent to me, um, it, it dealt with the fivefold ministry. 
and it goes this way. You know, the, the fivefold ministry is apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. And if we're truly worshiping God as fivefold, this is the way it is. The apostle, that's a servant who builds. The prophet, a servant who reveals. A teacher, a servant who explains. An evangelist, a servant who reaches. And a pastor, a servant who shepherds. You see the constant theme through it? What was the word? Servant. You see, no one's exempt. No one's exempt. Am I ministering? We call them ministers. I'm a minister of the gospel, which actually, by definition, means I'm a servant of the gospel. Am I congruent enough to allow my worship, to allow my heart to fall fully in worship? Am I acting on these core values? Because all of those core values wrap up into oasis, worship, center. Oasis is the ministry that is centered on worship. That's where the name comes from. But that means we've got to be a people that are congruent with what we proclaim. They always say the baby becomes what you name it. I think about my kids and they all live up to their names. I can't imagine Michael being called Benjamin. It, it doesn't work, does it? Etika sitting back there going, no, it, does, it just doesn't work. It, it, because Benjamin became Benjamin. Michael has become Michael. Oasis Worship Center is becoming Oasis Worship Center. A place that loves people. Because if you go back and you look at our vision, our vision statement just says this. The vision of Oasis Worship Center is to create a place of true worship. I may cry. To foster a move of the Holy Spirit that inspires people to experience more of God. See, Oasis Worship Center is more than just a church where we come and sit. Oasis Worship Center is a place to where we want to inspire people to true worship. And this is how we're going to accomplish it. Oasis Worship Center, the mission is to help equip and mature the children of God. To do the work of the ministry. We're going to do that through teaching and training on a church level as well as on a collegiate level. We will challenge the people of God to see their God-given purpose and help them strive to fulfill that purpose. This is Oasis Worship Center. We've spent the last five weeks discussing our core values, the way that we want to operate the way we want to live our lives, not just here, but out in our sphere of influence, in our world. God is looking for a group of people that are congruent. They don't just say it, they live it. To where it's in front of us in everything that we do. Because why, my biggest desire is that when God is looking around seeking a true worshiper, he stops here and says, there they are. What is the desire of God's heart? 
So many times we try to figure all these things out. What is the will of God for my life? What am I called to do? What am I supposed to do? Anytime you ask yourself that question, simply go back to John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now is. That means we're in it right now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God's desire for you is simple. He desires you to be a true worshiper. What is a true worshiper? A person that shares and evangelizes and does, goes into all the world and makes disciples. A person that loves, that loves their neighbor as they love themselves and they love God with everything that's in them. They grow, they get closer to God, they, they, they give to God, and they also disciple and teach others to do the same. They serve. They serve in the church. They serve in their communities. They serve in their own homes. They're true servants. And they live it in worship every day. See, that's what God's looking for. That is what worshiping him in spirit and in truth is really is. So to close today, I would ask you this. I would ask you to do, I want to call it a worship checkup. I want us to look at our own personal lives and say, where do I stand in worshiping God in spirit and truth? Am I saying one thing and living another? Or am I congruent with my speech and my heart? I say that I love God and I say that God is first, but is he? I say that he's the most important thing to me, that I have nothing without him, but do I believe it? God is looking for those that worship him in spirit and truth. Will he find you faithful? Will he find me faithful? Will he look down and say, I know there are a people in north central West Virginia that worship me wholly in truth, in their spirit, in their life, in everything they do. This is the goal. This is Oasis Worship Center. It's who we are. It's what we do. It's how we behave. It's how we act. So all I can ask for you to do is this. Begin to become congruent with who you are. Love God with everything that's in you. Seek after him with everything that's in you. Because your attitude is going to propel you towards God. How fast will you get to God? Well, that depends on your attitude. That's a sermon for another day. (laughs) Amen. Let me uh, just say this today in closing. If there's anyone out there today that is watching this and listening to this that does not know the Jesus that I've been talking about, has never had that relationship, or maybe has had that relationship in the past and is just not living the way they should. You know, the grace of God is sufficient no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through. And it's really simple. If you don't know that Jesus, I'd love to introduce you to him. See, that Jesus left heaven and came to earth because we were separated from God. And there needed to be a way that we could come back to the presence of God. So Jesus left heaven and came here. And in coming here, he died on a cross to pay the price for the sin of mankind. That would be yours 
That would be mine. And he loves you. And the word of God said there's one simple way to get back into the presence of God, to become a child of God, and that is just simply to ask Jesus into your heart. So I'm going to say this prayer, and I just ask you to repeat it with me. Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I ask today that you come into my heart, that you be Lord of my life. I believe that you died, were buried, and rose again so that I can have a relationship with God again. Amen. If you prayed that with me today, please get in touch with me. Drop me a message. Call the church because we would love to help you as you start this new journey uh, in walking and becoming and being more Christ-like. So I love you guys. I appreciate you. Uh, if you can, if we can do anything for you at all, please reach out to us. Uh, if you have a prayer request or prayer needs, just send them in to us and we would love to pray with you. So God bless you. Have a great, great day.